The title of this evening's Bible study is Abram Disconnected. Abram Disconnected. So we're going to look at Isaiah chapter 64. And the prophet Isaiah said, But now, O Lord, thou art our father. And then he says this, he says, We are the clay, and thou art potter. And we all are the work of thy hand. We are the clay, and thou art, thou art potter. You see, the potter is the master, and the clay is the subject. The potter must first go and find the clay in order to make any vessel. And Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 13, verses 45 and 46. Again, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. You see, going back to the idea of the potter and the master you have, uh, and the clay, when a potter decides to make a vessel, he has to go and buy that field. He can't just go and take someone else's clay. He has to go and buy the field that has the clay he wants. Then the potter purchases that field and begins to remove the clay to create his masterpieces. And he'll start by removing a large clump of clay. He'll start by removing a manageable amount. But then he pulls off even smaller amounts of clay from that larger portion in order to make exactly what he desires to create. The potter then develops his clay by moving that clay between his fingers. He kneads it as though it was dough, and he pounds on that clump of clay, and he rolls it out, and he hits it with his fist, and he makes the clay softer and more malleable, and he does this over and over again, and he continues to remove all the rocks and the pebbles. He continues to remove the dirt, the sticks, and the twigs. He removes all the impurities that are in the clay. And when the potter believes that the clay is ready, he will put the clump of clay in the center of his wheel. And the potter begins to spin the wheel with his feet while the clay rests on the center of that table. And he begins to work it with his hands. And I want to remind you of this. The prophet Isaiah said this, Thou, O Lord, are our father. We are the clay and you are our potter. And we are the work of your hand. And that wheel is spinning and the resting clay is moved and the potter creates. And no one can create in your life what God can create in your life. Amen. Amen. What was once just a clay uh, in, in an empty field now is on the potter's wheel being shaped into something beautiful, being shaped into an incredible vessel. It was just out there laying under the, the burning sun and under the uh, storms and the rain. But now it's on the table in the hands of the master. But first, that clay had to be removed from the field. It had to be disconnected from the field where it had been for so long. And then the clay had to be cleaned. It had to be uh, uh, made pure. It had to have all the rocks and sticks removed. And finally, it rests there on that wheel. But that is not the end of the process. When the potter thinks that the clay is ready and that the vessel that he created is ready, he will carefully remove that vessel from the potter's wheel and he will take it and he will put it in an oven that has been prepared. It will be at the right temperature and he will keep it at the right temperature. And that, that vessel will stay in the oven until it is completely finished and it is cured and it is solid. And the almighty God is the potter and we are the clay. And yes, sometimes we feel like we're in a field and sometimes we feel like we're being pulled apart. And sometimes it feels like we're being kneaded as though we are dough. And sometimes we feel the burning fire of the furnace. But I want you to know that's God working in your life. No person or being knows more about you or me or your circumstances or your situations than Jesus Christ. Even the very hairs on your head are all numbered. Jesus knows more about you and he knows more about me than any of us will ever know about our own selves. And Jesus can find you where you are. There is no field out of his reach. You have not disappeared from the sight of Jesus Christ. You have not gone out of his reach. And the prophet Isaiah said in the 59th chapter, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save. Neither is his ear heavy that it can, cannot hear. You need to know God can reach you. And God can go and he will go 
to that field and purchase that field and buy that field and remove that clump of clay, you and me, for his service to make us the vessel that he wants us to be. And we see that illustrated in the life of Abram. The Bible says in Hebrews 11, by faith Abraham, when he was called out, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed and he went out not knowing whither he went. You see, Abram lived in Ur of the Chaldees and he was surrounded by idol worshipers. And like all of Abram's neighbors, Abram was as misinformed and lost as any of, they were, uh, as any of those people were. And he worshiped idols just like anyone else did in his area. But Abram also heard the stories and read the writings of his ancestors because Abram was a descendant of Adam, Seth, Enoch, Noah, and Seth, men who believed in the one true God. These men were preachers. These men were preachers of righteousness. These men were patriarchs. These men were prophets. But somehow, Abram now resided in Ur of the Chaldees, surrounded by idols and idol worshipers. But God was ready to call his people out from among the heathens. So Paul told the church, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And I will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. And that is exactly the call from God to Abram. Because if you look at Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, you see, The Lord has said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. God called Abram out. He said, come out from among them and be separate. And the covenant with God does not end and has not ended and it doesn't change. It is still come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord. That's still the call of God. He is still going to the field and saying, I'll buy that field. I can use that clay. But he says, I got to pull you out. Separation is required. Being disconnected from the world is required. In order for the clay to become an incredible and useful and beautiful vessel, it must be separated from the field. The potter can't turn it into a vessel there, there in the field. It can't stay connected to everything else and still become the vessel that God wants it to be. It must be made clean. It must be made pure. It must be holy. It must be righteous. The same was required of Abram. And the Apostle Paul made it abundantly clear that the same is required of you and me and for the church. Abram was called out of and called away from the world. And God specifically went and called Abram because Abram was of the lineage of Seth and Noah and Shem and would be of the lineage of the Messiah. God took the initiative through his grace and his mercy and through his love. And he called Abram and, and by faith, Abram, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, he obeyed and he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he sojourned in a land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which had foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Abram did this because God's word spoke to him. Paul said that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. God spoke to Abram. And so Abram had faith and he believed. And so he went on and he journeyed out away from his daddy. God spoke to Abram about another country. Abram was looking for that other country. He was looking for that other city and the unknown city filled Abram's mind and it filled Abram's dreams and he, he kept traveling and he kept journeying. He said, this world is not my home. He said, I, I feel like traveling on. Abram did not find that wonderful city in the cities of Nimrod. It wasn't there in Babylon. It wasn't there in Nineveh. No, Abram continued to travel. He continued looking for that great city. It continued to fill his heart and his mind and his dreams. And, and Hebrews says, these all died in faith, 
not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on this earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country, that is, in heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. He's prepared for us a city. I'm looking for a city. One of these days, I'm going to go to the by and by. I'm going to cross that crystal sea. I'm going to walk up on that shore. I'm going to go through those pearly gates. I want you to understand, New Jerusalem is being prepared for you and me. And Abram said, I'm looking for a city. And I want you to know I'm looking for a city. And so Abram went looking and died not having received the promise. And we've all read through the Bible and we read from Genesis through the Old Testament. We read all the prophets and all the history. And then you continue on into the, the New Testament. You, you read through all the Gospels and you read the epistles. And, and it's not until we get to John the Revelator's revelation from Christ that we discover this. The Bible says that Abram was looking for a city. But it's not until we get to Revelation 21, 14 that we see this. And the wall of that city had 12 foundations. And in them, the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Verse 19 says, And the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. You see, that city in the by and by beyond the crystal sea, it awaits us on that bright and glorious morning. And, and God speaks to you and me about a new Jerusalem. But he says, you got to get disconnected from the world. He tells us of gates of pearl and he tells us of streets of gold. And, and God gave Abram a ticket to that great city. The moment that Abram, he removed Abram as a clump of clay from the Ur of Chaldees, as the moment that he said, I'm removing you from this field. And he said, for you were bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit. And so God removed Abram from that field. He removed Abram from the Ur of the Chaldees. He disconnected Abram from his father and from his people. God's first demands for Abram were this. Have faith and obey. Have faith and obey. The, the crazy thing is this. Obedience verifies your faith. It's easy to have faith and say, oh, I believe God can heal. Right. Uh, yeah, but are you willing to go lay hands on someone? Are you willing to keep praying until you see that healing? Obedience proves your belief is genuine and strong. When I see missionaries leave their families here in the United States and they go live in a third world nation, I, I realize they have some pretty incredible obedience and faith to go do such a thing. And God told Abram, he said, leave your daddy, leave your family, leave your homeland. And God told Abram to go and become a pilgrim and a stranger here in this, in this land and, and on this earth. And God told Abram, he said, you turn your back on the things of the world. You got to completely disconnect. And so Jesus tells us, he says, lay not up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Where moth and rust doth corrupt. Where thieves break through and steal. He said, don't, don't do that. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. One of the problems we have in our society today, it was we're so connected to our earthly treasures. I've said it a lot. God is not against you being wealthy, and I hope all of you are wealthy in this life. We know that Job, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and many other people in the Bible, Esther and Ruth, all had wealth at some point in their life. God's not against you being wealthy. You just can't be connected to it. You got to let it go. And like you and me, God expected Abram to walk by faith and not by sight. You see, being called by God is to be called away from this world. I, I need to disconnect. One of the biggest problems in our society today is this right here. But we're so connected to everything. 
We're so connected to everything. And, uh, you know, people that have, uh, when they get home from work, they have to look at Facebook. You know, they have to go on Twitter or Snapchat, Instagram, whatever it is, as soon as, as, soon as they get a chance. Or even at work, you'll find them uh, taking a moment to use the work computers to look at whatever social media sites are there. And, and, and I read an article not too long ago about the number of people who, when they get up, the very first thing they do is they start looking at their social media. And before any of you judge any of them, I know you used to read your newspapers with your morning coffee. So just putting that out there, when they used to deliver papers. Now you read it when you pick it up and take it to work with you. <laughs> but we're so, dis we're so connected. We're so connected to everything. We want to be connected all the time. And, 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 and I'm preaching about being disconnected, disconnecting from the world. And, 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 and so we are called by God and called away from the world. And, and God calls you to be separated. And, and never forget this. I, I, I want you to see this point. All the way at the beginning of the Bible, we see in Genesis 1, 4, it says, God saw the light and it was good. And then he immediately says, God divided the light from the darkness. He immediately separated it. He immediately said, these two things must be separated. And so look what Paul said to the church in 2 Corinthians, where he said, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? You see, there is no connection. There's no communion with light and darkness. And you are called to be light, and you are called to be salt. And so there's, there's no connection there. And God separated the light from the darkness, and God separated the land from the sea. And he separated the waters and the, and the ground from the ferment of the air. You see, separation is required by God. Separation is the law of God. you got to disconnect from this world. And when the trumpet sounds, if you're connected, you won't be leaving. This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blood. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I cannot be let home in this world anymore. God disconnects us from the world. God disconnected Abram from everything he had in this life with the exception of his household. That's the only thing that God didn't disconnect Abram from. You see, Abram left Ur with his wife and with his household. And Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And Noah sailed from the old world into the new world with his wife and his children. You see, that's how God works. God disconnected Abram from Ur and from his dad and from his idol worship. And Abram became Abraham. And Abraham became a giant in the spirit world and became a hero of faith. Amen? you got to disconnect. If you want an Abraham kind of life, you're going to have to disconnect from this world. You're going to be able to walk away from some things. You're going to have to be able to say no to some things. Do not be afraid to do it. Yes, we live here physically, and you need to. Jesus said, render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. Jesus told us that. You, you need to pay your bills. You need to pay your taxes. You need to obey the laws of the land. The Bible doesn't give us any outs there. We obey the laws of the land. We put food on the table. We put a roof over our family's head. That is expected of us in the word of God. But this flesh, this body is going to return to the ground one of these days. And nothing I did in this life is really going to matter. Except for the things that I did and do that are connected to the eternal. I want to be connected to what's eternal and disconnected from what's temporal. I want to be connected to the things of God and disconnected from the things of this world. You see, nothing in Abram's life that he did back in Ur mattered. You don't read about all the great triumphs of Abram back in Ur. What, what, what really mattered? I'll tell you what mattered. What mattered was Abram risking his own life to save the life of Lot. And when Abram feared retaliation from the kings who had kidnapped Lot and he had he'd gone and conquered them and got, Ab got Lot back, the Bible says this in Genesis 15. He says, in these things, the word of the Lord 
came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. You see, when Abram said, uh, what really matters is the lives of other people. What really matters is, is protecting other people. If nothing Abram did in Ur really mattered, then what really mattered? What mattered was going after Lot and saying, I've got to save somebody. What matters, somebody else's soul matters, and I gotta go take care of that. What mattered was Abram saying, I gotta go win somebody, I gotta disciple somebody. And, and you say, well, I, I'm not sure how to do that. I'm telling you, God said, I'll be your exceeding great reward. What really mattered was Abram going and saving someone. What really mattered was when Abram put Isaac on the altar. That's what really mattered. And God provided a ram in the thicket. You see, obedience to God proves that you really have faith. Obedience to God proves that you really do have faith. Obedience to God's word, even when you don't understand God's word, proves you really believe. I'm, I'm going to get very transparent with you right now. I was praying in my office. I was on the floor and laying on my, across my chair, sitting on the floor, and I'm in there praying. I'm like, God, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And I was just really getting into my prayer, God. I, I really want your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. And I just, I'm like, God, I really want to speak out my heart, my mind to you. And, and as I'm praying, I said, God, I don't like your will. I'm just being real right now. That's what obedience is. When you say, I don't understand it, I don't even like it right now. You think, you think the vessel wants to go through the fire? You, you, you think the vessel wants the potter to be kneading all those sticks and rocks out of there? You, you think the vessel wants to be pulled out of the field? Your will on earth as it is in heaven. Your will on earth as it is in heaven. Obedience to God's word, it proves you really believe. And, and, and so the field was purchased. And the clump of clay was removed. It was separated from the field before it could ever become anything. It was disconnected from everything it had always been. From the beginning of creation, that clump of clay has been in that field. It's felt every storm, it's felt every whisk of wind, it's, it's, it's felt every beating ray of sunshine. But now the master has purchased it and removed it from the field. And the clay has to be worked in the hands of the master. I heard it said one time that when the master's working the clay, and trying to remove all the rocks and the sticks and, and the impurities, that, that those sharp objects in there cut the master's hands, and the blood of the master ends up in the clay vessel. Nothing like having the blood of Jesus applied to your life. Nothing like having the blood of Jesus applied to your life. And then the clay has to go through the fire, but ultimately, the clay becomes something that's incredible. Ultimately, the clay becomes something useful. It becomes something, best, uh, uh, something beautiful. And, and you see, Abram had to be removed from Ur, and, and he was separated. He was disconnected, and, and he was worked in the hands of Jehovah. And certainly, by all means, Abram was tried by fire. None of us have put our son on the altar. He was tried by fire. He was separated. And God has called you to disconnect from the field where he pulled you out of. You see, God wants to work in, in your life. And, and like the clay, God wants to remove everything that keeps you from becoming the perfect vessel. And, and I, I, I'm not preaching against television. Please don't misunderstand me. But people who miss church for a television show, that, that, that's rocks and twigs in your clay. People who, who won't turn off a television show that's got prostitution or pornography or language or violence on it, and, and they just keep watching it, that, that's rocks and twigs in your clay. P people who won't turn off music that, that has foul language or, or talks about uh, uh, fornication or, or, or glorifies that kind of stuff, that, that's rocks and twigs in your clay. 
And I'm trying to tell you, God pulled you out of the field and he's trying to remove the, the rocks and twigs in your clay. And, and when you feel the, the conviction of God on your life and you feel the Holy Spirit convict you because you shouldn't be watching something or, or listening to something or doing something, that, that's God trying to, to pull the rocks and the twigs out of your clay. And, and, and you feel the conviction of the Holy Ghost and, and he's saying, I'm trying to make you a beautiful vessel. And you're grabbing a hold of the twigs and the clay and you're saying, don't, no, 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 don't take that. And God's saying, no, 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 I'm trying to make you a beautiful vessel. And if you don't let me, then I can't put you through the fire. And separation can be so lonely. When, when the master is using his fist and he's, he's pushing on that clay and he's, he's working it, it can be so painful. Brother Velarde's been working on all the bushes around the church and and if you keep cutting them back, they, they keep growing and they keep looking nice. But you just let them go and they turn into a wild, unkept, not pretty plants. Pruning hurts. But it's what makes you what you need to be. The fire is hot. The fire burns. But the fire is what gives the clay, the power to continue to stand. You see, if he just took the vessel off of the potter's wheel and set it on the shelf, it would slowly sag. It would slowly drop, and it would slowly become just another pile of clay again. But once the clay's been through the fire, it has the stamina and the ability to continue to stand and to face whatever comes its way. You see, the results are incredible, and the results are what really matters. And you need to disconnect, and you need to say, I, I, I've had enough of the world. And, and you need to let the master potter pull you out of the field and disconnect you from, from all the things of this world. And you need to let the potter say, uh, uh, it, it's, it's time for this to be pulled out of your life. And, and, and here's something I need you to understand. The potter doesn't just immediately start whipping things out of the clay. No, he puts it on the potter's wheel. And he slowly works it and he slowly pulls it out. And, and because you see, the potter could destroy the clay in the process of removing the rocks and the twigs and the impurities if he doesn't do it in the right way. He could destroy the clay in the process, but he knows better. And so he takes his time. And as he feels with his hands and his fingers and, and, he, and he works it, he slowly removes this rock and that twig. And, and slowly but surely, he gets it all removed. And so I don't care if you've been living for God for 400 years. He needs to still be removing some stuff from your life. So Peter said this. He said, wherein you greatly rejoice. Though now for a season, if need be. And Peter said this. He said, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. You're in heaviness through many temptations. Verse 7 says this. That the trial, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire. The trial of your faith. He's telling us, your faith is going to be tried. But when it is tried, it will be more precious than gold tried by fire you got to go through the fire that it might be found into the praise and the honor and the glory at the appearing of jesus christ one of these days jesus christ is going to come back and if you've been tried by the fire you'll be there for his praise glory and honor but if you haven't made it through the fire you won't be doing anything peter said whom having not seen you love and whom though now you see him not yet believing you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. And then he says this, he said, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Abram didn't just jump up and volunteer and say, here, God pick me. No, God found a field and said, I want that field. 
God saw a man and said, I want that man. He said, I want that clump of clay. And he formed it and he fashioned it with his hands. And he takes you and he forms you and he fashions you with your, his hands. And back in Genesis, the Bible says that he breathed into Adam and the breath of life and he became a living soul. He pulls you from the field and he breathes into you his spirit. He fills you with his spirit and spiritually you come alive. Spiritually, you begin to live because you were dead in trespasses and sin. And spiritually, you come alive and you begin to live. But he says, I, I, I need to work on you. He says, I, I need to remove some things from your life. And if God tried to remove everything from your life that's not good for you at once, you wouldn't be able to handle it. There's a reason we grow in Christ. But you can't quit growing. And you can't quit disconnecting. The moment you quit growing is the moment that you'll begin to reconnect. Because you leave a plant somewhere, and it'll find somewhere to put its roots. And you've got to stay disconnected. I'm not going to get reconnected to this world. I, I, I don't want the things of this world in my mind. I don't want the things of this world in my heart. I, I, I don't want the things of this world contaminating my life. I'm a diehard U.S. citizen of the United States of America. I love this country. I think this is the greatest country that's ever existed. I don't want my patriotism contaminating my spirit. I don't want my patriotism contaminating my spirit. I want to leave the ground where the trumpet sounds. George Washington's not going to save me. Abraham Lincoln's not going to save me. I, I, I want to leave this ground when, when the trumpet sounds. I, I, I want to be disconnected. I, I want to leave.